Good morning. It's funny, we were practicing this morning and I had a little case of the sillies and a little case of the, hey, I'm not staying focused. So I was telling, just telling Sandy, I'm like, I'm gonna try to stay focused this morning. And I looked at the clock and I'm like, oh, I guess I should get my guitar on, huh? <laughs> so I already prayed for me to stay focused during praise. Let's go ahead and stand up and we're gonna begin our praise and worship with, hello, my name is. Hello, my name is Regret. I'm pretty sure we have met. Every single day of your life, I wish her inside. That won't let you forget. 
that song. We're going to continue this morning with resurrecting. Dry mouth this morning, sorry.
So I just love using the worship time as, to, as a time to prepare us and all of our hearts to hear the word of God through the sermons. This part, of the ser- it, this part of the service is where we get to love God. It's where we get to show our hearts and where we get to prepare our hearts. And in the first song, we recognized our sta- statuses, our status as children of God. I mean, the world tells us that we're nothing. The world tells us that we're stupid. The world tells us that we're not good enough. But that song reminds us that those are the lies of this world and then that the truth of God is that he loves us and his love just lavishes on us. The second song, it was, it was the truth about our resurrected king. Jesus knelt to wash our feet. He wore a crown of thorns and he died on a cross for us because God loves us. And now through his resurrection, we come alive. I mean, our lives are for God. Our lives are nothing without God. So for us to be able to just sing our thanks and sing our praise to God, it's just awesome. Through his resurrection, we have the victory in Jesus. We have the victory in our lives. The third song is going to remind us of God's ancient word. God gave us the Bible. God gives us the words. It's kind of like the guidebook for our lives. Psalm 119.11 says, I've hidden, my, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Having God's word in our heart is our guidebook for life. It's what's already there, how we can make it through life, how we can help other people in life. It's the truth of life. And the last song that we'll sing, well, I love that song. It kind of brings us into the arms of the Father um, as we're coming to the altar And it just reminds us of coming to the altar to worship God. And that song is just a good, great one to just kind of prepare our hearts to hear the words of God and to hear the sermon and hear that part of our worship service, God. God is just awesome. I just, let's just continue worship this morning, just lifting our whole hearts, thanking God for who he tells us we are, not the lies of the world, to thank God for the truth of what his son did for us that a lot of the world doesn't get, a lot of the world doesn't understand, and then just pray our hearts to hear the message. Let's pray. Dear Father God, thank you for loving us so much, God. Thank you for being in our lives, God, and I thank you that our hearts know you, God, and our hearts know what Jesus did for us, God, and our hearts know the love that you have for us, God. I pray this morning that as we continue with our worship, God, that you can just feel our love, God. Just take down any barriers that we have right now between us and between you, God. And I just pray that this house of worship that you gave us can just be filled with our voices being lifted up for you, God. And I also pray a prayer for the people who don't know you yet and don't know of Jesus, God, that you open our hearts to see what doors you're opening for us to help those people to be guided towards you, God. I just pray this morning that You just help us to keep our eyes and our ears open to your will, God. And thank you so much for letting us come together to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll be singing ancient words.
just think of how much of the world doesn't have those words available. I just appreciate the efforts that people are putting towards getting his words available in every culture. Amen. We're going to continue with we'll come to the altar. <laughs>
Thanks, Matt. Matt is drastically overestimating my height. <laughs> I am far, I am far too, too short. Well, good morning. How is everybody? Well, it's good to see all your happy, smiling faces. Now, I have to say that your faces become more happy and smiley the more nearsighted I get, so I can't see hardly anything in the back row. And when I try to wear my glasses, then I can't read my Bible. This is just, this is just what happens when you get old. You know, you have 14 pairs of glasses, you lose 13. Isn't that true? Raise your hand if you've ever lost a pair of glasses. Yeah, see? See, you make me feel better already. <laughs> well, I am Brian. I'm pastor here at Baptist Fellowship. So if you happen to be joining here with us for the first time this morning, I just want to extend a welcome, let you know we're really glad that you're here. Um, your presence and our ability to reach people for the gospel of Jesus Christ is the central and most important thing that we do as a church. Can I get an amen from everybody else? So I hope that you consider this place at least for the Sunday your church home. And if you'd like to call this place your church home permanently, we'd be glad to have you. We're a big, crazy, dysfunctional family of God, I tell you. A couple of things as we start to get going here before I pray. A couple of announcements. The first one is that on September 13th, we will have Grief Share starting at 10 a.m., that's going to be in Grace Cafe, and if you happen to not be familiar with the building, if you go up the stairs and just keep going as far as anyone can humanly possibly go, and then turn right, that is where you will find uh, the Grace Cafe area. Now, if you walk out of this door and you see a set of stairs on the left, don't take that set of stairs. That will lead you to the balcony. That will lead you to the other set of stairs that comes from the balcony, which just keeps going down, and you can do that circuit for many, um, many minutes. Ask me how I know. Hmm. So take it when you came into the church, if you take a left out of here and then go up that far set of stairs and then just keep going, that's where Grace Cafe is. On September 14th, we'll have family night that kicks off from 6 o'clock until 7.30. Family night isn't just for Awana kids, although it is certainly for children who are eligible to be part of our Awana program, but it's also for adults. Dennis will have a study uh, and I will um, be starting a, a parent study so we can kind of figure out what it looks like to be a godly parent. And if you're at all interested in that, uh, tap me on the shoulder and I'd be happy to let you know how to get there and how to sign up. It's real easy. You just tell me you're coming and I'll wait for you. On September 18th, we'll have Children and Youth Sunday beginning at 9 a.m. Um, and then on the 25th, Junior Church will kick off 6 to 10 year olds during that service. On September 25th, we will have our business meeting. Everybody cheer. Yay, woohoo! business meeting. <laughs> and then on October 1st, um, Love Saves Lives Walk, will, um, be, which is sponsored by the Women's Center, will happen from 12 to 2. And then on October 9th, we will have communion and potluck at 12 p.m. in Cooper Fellowship Hall. And if memory serves me correctly, we will probably be doing church service a little bit differently as we celebrate communion in a way that folds it into the meal, but I'll have more information about that as I get the details. And then on September 29th, the Seniors Bible Study, do I hear murmurings here? Am I saying something wrong? You wanna correct me, Carol? I was just, I was gonna mention that there has been a change. There has been a change. You are correct in what you just said. Yeah, so it's 10, it's not 10-2, it's 10-9, and that has just been changed by virtue of, of my crazy schedule. And then September 29th, the Seniors Bible Study, which um, Dennis Ryder will be leading, um, will be starting, on, I think it's at least the week of the 29th, I'm not sure if it is the 29th, it's a Thursday. Yeah, so that's a Thursday morning. Um, so those are the announcements. Also, the last announcement I wanna make, which I will make before we have communion this um, afternoon, and it'll probably be afternoon like 12.01, um, is that we at Baptist Fellowship have an open communion policy. And what that means is if there's been a time in your life in which you have crossed the threshold of faith and called Jesus your Lord and Savior, then we wanted to invite you to participate in communion here at Baptist Fellowship. You don't have to be a member uh, to be participating in communion. If you claim Christ as your Savior, we hope that you will join with us. And if you don't yet claim Christ as your Savior, then keep your ears peeled, and uh, maybe that will change by the time I'm done talking. We'll see. Let's go before the Lord and ask him for his blessing on our time this morning. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for every blessing that you have poured out on us in 
the person of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord God, we live busy, busy lives as we see the seasons beginning to change. We know that that means a whole new set of activities and priorities in the life of our church. And it also likely means a whole new set of priorities and activities in the life of the people who attend our church and those whom we hope to reach. Father, as children end up going back to school as they begin the rhythms of of getting up, getting ready, going to school, as parents make those adjustments to those facts, as we all begin to look at what it means to settle in for the fall and then eventually the winter, uh, Lord, just the, the reality of the world in which we live and the climate in which we live it, um, Father, brings to bear a number of different concerns. And it is so easy in the midst of that, God, uh, to forget that while there is much that changes in our world around us, from the leaves to our activities, to our calendar, to the busyness in which we embrace often during uh, this season, uh, that you are the same, that you do not change, that your mercies are new every morning, uh, that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever, and that you call us in many ways to do the same works that we did in the beginning, to love you, to give our hearts to you, to trust in you. And Father, when we do that, Lord, we find that the busyness of our calendars and the busyness of the season begins to make sense and we can balance it and handle it because we know uh, that your grace abounds to us. So Father, I pray whether it is seasonal change or the changes that people experience as they age, Lord, may we all continue to just rest in the truth of our Lord and Savior when he told us that we must not fear, for he has overcome the world. And we do lift up those who are in prayer whose seasons of life have changed, and now they need our prayer. They are experiencing difficulty, many of them ailing in their health. And we think this morning of Paul Lambert. Father, would you be with him as he was in recovery from his surgery? They've recently found that there is a screw that has come loose in one of his vertebrae from the surgery. And Lord, that causes a number of concerns and fears that must occupy his mind and his time. And so, Father, would you just be with him? Draw him close to you. Be with he and Laura as they seek to do everything they can to find the wisdom through medical doctors to, to decide what to do. But ultimately, Lord, we pray um, that as he is in your hands, that you will be his healer and his strength and his sustainer during this time. Lord, we also pray for those who cannot be with us. We think of Neil Christopher and the constant battle of pain that he endures. Father, would you be with him and strengthen him during this season of his life and this time of need. We continue to lift up our sister, Ruthie Richardson. Father, would you be with her? Help her, Lord God. Strengthen her. Draw close to her, we pray. And Father, we pray for Jason York as he continues to recover uh, from his transplant. And Father, thank you for the victory that you have brought to him and that being successful and just continue, we pray, Lord, to help him to walk through health. But we also pray, Lord God, not only for the health of individuals, but for the health of our families and for the health of our church. For families, Lord God, we know that these seasons bring a number of different challenges. And so, Lord God, would you help us to handle them with grace and with gentleness. As we begin in Baptist Fellowship to, to see ministries begin to reignite after a long period of fallow soil during COVID, Lord God, I pray that you would help us to be faithful with the opportunities that we have and be with the workers and strengthening them as they seek to reach out to others. And Father, would you always keep before us the direction that you would have us to go that we may faithfully walk in your path. And finally, Lord God, I pray that as we open your word this morning, that you would speak to us through the words of this book, and that you would hide uh, the sinful and flawed man who preaches them behind the cross, that these people would have come here to say, sir, we would see Jesus. 
and that by the end of my speaking they will have forgotten all that is not of you, that you would burn away the dross. And Father, that which would remain would be the pure, unadulterated, eternal word of God. And I pray these things in Jesus' blessed name and all God's people said, amen. Um, I also want to just take a minute, if we can, and just have a, prayer, a special prayer for um, those who lost their lives and the first responders who came to the aid um, in 9-11. Um, and this is 9-11, and uh, that for many of you is a memory, perhaps something that you saw on television. For others, it's something that they saw very personally and close. And so um, if we could just have a minute of prayer, and we, we did uh, receive some flowers. Sue and Willie Bell brought flowers in honor of that. Uh, can we give them a, a word of thanks for that and helping them, thank them for helping us to remember that? And we just give them a clap for them if you want, or pat them on the back. Or if you got chocolate, you can always throw it at Willie. He'll take it. Hmm. If you got chocolate. He's usually throwing it at me, but not from back there. Hmm. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for grace and peace. And Lord, we do pray for those who gave their lives and those who lost their lives during 9-11. We pray for the first responders who took part in the rescue efforts, the many of whom experienced long-term consequences for their heroics. And we pray, Lord God, that as we as a nation uh, would be able to heal from that moment, but we would never be ones who would forget the honor and the valor of those who responded and the lives who were lost in that time. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Well, if you're joining us for the first time, we've been moving our way slowly through the summer through the book of Galatians. And in the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians, we have been studying the fruit of the Spirit. And so, um, I am going to ask our regular congregation if they would to help recite with me Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Hopefully you've come pretty close to memorizing that. Um, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Amen. And so we've been working through each one of those words as a category. And we find ourselves talking this morning about the fruit of gentleness. What does it mean to, to be gentle? And, and I will tell you one illustration that has helped me the most as I've, I've kind of worked through this in my mind a little bit this week is, is one of the lies, and I'm, I'm sorry to have to say that there were a number of things that they told me when I was candidating here 17 years ago that were 100% true, but there are some lies that they told to get me here, I'm convinced of it. Um, and, and one of them is that this never happens, this never happens, and I, what I mean by that is this. When I came to New England, um, I was expecting a more gentle climate than I, I found, <laughs> okay? Now, I came from Colorado, so you'd think, well, you should be well prepared for it, but I will tell you that in Denver, Colorado, there are probably 300 sunny days a year. Almost all of the precipitation gets dumped on the other side of the mountain. You can expect it to be somewhere in the 50s in the middle of the winter, and the snow will come, and it will be pretty, and then it will burn off, and the roads will be clear, and everything will be bright and happy and sunny again. And when I came to New England, that just was not the case. It just didn't happen. And the lies that people would tell me were things like that when it, when it snowed in October and kept snowing and didn't stop to the point that I had to get up on the top of my roof with a roof rake and push snow off the top of it and then I was done and I talked to people, they said, well, this never happens, this is unique. <laughs> That's a lie, because it's happened to me at least four times since then. And then when we had to batten down the hatches because apparently there was a hurricane, and literally there has to be just a very few places on the earth in which in one season you have to shovel snow off the top of your roof, and in another season prepare for a hurricane. Well, it just doesn't happen anywhere else. And I, I, I would t people were telling me, well, this just doesn't happen. This is, this is brand new. That's another lie. How many hurricanes have we lived through here in New England in the last 17 years? I can't tell you the number of times that I've had to pick up the phone and say, we can't get out of our driveway. It's been completely washed out. We do not live in a gentle climate. We don't. Now, the reason that, 
we look at nature and we see the power of the weather and, and we in some senses have some apprehension about what it will bring is because we know the power that is contained therein. Does that make sense? Like nature can do some pretty destructive things. And there still isn't just a whole lot that we can do about it. There's lots of things and destructive elements and forces in our world that we can control, but you can't control the weather. You can predict it, sort of. You can prepare for it, kind of. But you can't stop it. It's just going to come. I can think of an instance in my life in which I had a great appreciation for the power of the weather. And that was when my, my, my family and I in Wyoming were going down a little rafting tour at a little town that I had. There was an adjacent river called the Platte River. If you ever go out to Wyoming, you can look up the Platte River. It's not much to bo boast about. But it's nice to have a little ra raft, and we were out there in the middle of the summer, but then a storm brewed and, and overtook us, and we put our little rubber raft up on the side of the, the embankment on the river and just were there waiting it out when all of a sudden we heard and saw a bolt of lightning at roughly the same time. I don't know if you've ever been through that kind of experience, but it was close enough that the static electricity that was a result of that made all of our hairs on our, on our arms and on our heads stand straight up. It was so deafening that we couldn't hear. We heard ringing in our ears for the next 20 minutes, right? That's how close it was. Um, and at that point in time, I had a great appreciation for just how powerful those storms can be. Well, the reality of the matter is that God is infinitely more powerful than the greatest storm that we could ever endure. Does that make sense? I mean, even if you don't believe in God, you must at least believe that if there was a God, then he who had the ability to create the world and create the weather patterns has to be far greater than the weather than he created. And yet this God in which we worship as all-powerful has sent his son into the world, and his son has described himself, who is God Almighty, as gentle. Let me give you an example of that, which will serve as the first main scripture that we'll go to. That's the book of Matthew, the 11th chapter. In Matthew chapter 11, starting in the 25th verse, the Bible says this. And I'll, I will tell you and give you a little bit of context that Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 and following come in the context of him having sent out his disciples to the cities of the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel, only to have many of them come back with a, a very mixed report. He said, Lord, even, even the demons obey us because of you, but he would go, they would go into cities, and often uh, the entire city would completely reject their message of the gospel of the kingdom. And so Jesus, in verse 20, begins to pronounce woes on the cities who would not receive his disciples and the coming destruction that they would face. And in verse 25, then he says this, at this time, Jesus declared... I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest." Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, there's a number of things that we can pull from this passage, the word of the Lord, as we hear it this morning. But the one that I want to focus on before we get into the, the, the very specifics is the nature of who Jesus is, who is described in this passage as gentle. 
as Christians, based upon what the Bible tells us, and while the word Trinity does not find its way into the New Testament, we find that as you study the New Testament, that there are tr three truths that, that come out and can only be reconciled in a single way about the nature of God. And the first one goes all the way back to the ancient understanding of the ancient Israelites and what they understood about God and compared to the surrounding nations, and that is God is one. We don't believe in a pantheon of gods. We don't believe in multiple gods. Every other ancient culture in the Near East believed in multiplicity of gods that all were associated in some sense with human needs. So you had fertility god and goddesses. You had gods who would govern the rain and represent the sun and the moon and the stars. And all of them, any, anything that man could not explain or any need that man had, usually what would happen is there would be a god that was created in the image of man <clears throat> in order to satisfy those things or to explain that lack of knowledge. Does that make sense? But there was this one nation, this fledgling nation that came from a person called named Abraham who left his country in Ur in order to serve the Lord and to seek the Lord. And from his descendants, 12 tribes of Jacob, who would later be called Israel, emerged. And they were one who believed that there was a divine, there was a divinity in the world, that there in fact and was some sense of God's presence, but he was singular, that there was only one God. In fact, the, the, the most commonly recited scripture in the Old Testament from the, even the modern day Jewish is called the Shema, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. There is one God, one person of God. He does not share <clears throat> his divinity with any other being. There are no other gods before the Lord God, which is why the very first commandment of the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments, which Moses gave, was that I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. There is only one God. And that is the first principle of our understanding of the Trinity, is there is only one God. The second is that that one God is shared by three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And we know that the Son and the Spirit are God because the New Testament tells us of the divinity of Christ and of the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And I won't go into great deal of detail. If you have questions, by all means, tap me on the shoulders and say, hey, where can I find that? But suffice it to say that the rest of the New Testament bears out the fact that not only is God Father, but he is also the Son and the Spirit. And that the Son had this amazing calling to come into the world incarnate on the first Christmas morning to be united with human nature in human flesh and to walk among us. So God himself, the one who created the world, the one who had the power to form the storms that we can't predict or control fully, is the one who walked among us. And he described himself as gentle. That's the first thing that I hope that we'll learn from this passage. The second is this, that Jesus, when he prays to his Father, says that he thanks him that, that the Father has hidden many truths or these things from the wise and understanding, but has revealed them to little children. Well, who are those little kids? Well, I don't think he's speaking necessarily of infants or of toddlers. I think he's talking about those who would come to believe in him, those who come to him with a childlike faith, those who, who are followers of Christ, this little flock that he had. He often referred to them as children. And he says that this was the gracious will of God, that he would reveal these truths to them. And then he says something, and if you've, if you've been at Baptist Fellowship for any length of time, you'll know that I make a big deal about this next passage. In fact, it is very likely that I have preached more on this passage than I have on any other passage. And the reason why I've done that is not because, you know, I don't, I don't have enough time to study anything else. It's because I think that of all the passages in the New Testament, this is the one that probably gives us the most information about how God discloses things and who he is. In verse 27, Jesus says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. Now, that's a weighty claim. But this next claim is even more weighty. And no one knows the Son except the Father, 
and no one knows the Father except the Son. Now, there's two claims, both of which would have been offensive and surprising to the ears of anyone who have heard him. The first one, he says, is nobody knows the Son except the Father. Now, that big, that nobody is a complete nobody. That means not his mom. That means not his followers. That means next, not his next door neighbors. Not the people who all thought that they knew who he was. When Jesus preached his first sermon, he walked into a synagogue, and Luke chapter 2 describes this. And after he preached, it was such an uproar that the people who were around him said first, well, who is this guy? Isn't he that carpenter's kid? And then they were so offended at what he said that they sought to stone him, right? We talk about a rocky start to a ministry. You preach your first sermon, they try to kill you afterwards. Like, I've had some rough sermons, but that's never yet happened to me. Although, you know, we'll see how it goes today, right? But that's because they didn't know who he was. They all thought they knew who he was, but they didn't know who he was. There was times in, in the New Testament when Jesus is described of talking about to his disciples and his mom and dad, like inter his mom and his brother actually interrupt and say, hey, can you go get Jesus? And, and his disciples are like, well, he's kind of preaching. It's like, well, I'm his mom. And so the disciples go and talk to Jesus, and Jesus says, who are my mother and my brothers? Those who do the will of God are my brother and my brothers. <laughs> Can you imagine the disciple had to go back and tell Jesus' his mom what he said? Can you imagine the look on her face? Well, why? Because he was doing his father's will. She didn't, even though she knew him probably better than any other human being knew him as a man. She had not yet been given the full vision of who Jesus was. No one knows the son except the father. Well, well why? Because the Father has known the Son, the eternal Son of God, God himself, for all eternity. And no one knows the Father except the Son. Now that, I believe, is even a more radical claim. Because the entirety of the Jewish faith that Jesus grew up in was predicated upon the idea that the Jewish people understood God when the rest of the cultures didn't. that the Jewish people got it and the Gentiles didn't. You with me? <clears throat> it's like, we understand. We've been given this knowledge. Those poor ignorant souls don't have the least bit of clue as to what it is they're doing. <clears throat> and there was some truth to that. The people of Israel had been given <clears throat> the knowledge of the Scriptures. The people of Israel had been given the benefit of the prophets. The people of Israel had been given teachers who would be able to discern what the Bible says and recount it to the people, but there was still something missing. And Jesus says, nobody knows the Father. I mean, you may think you know who God is, <clears throat> but nobody knows him like I know him. Nobody knows who God is like I know who God is. Because the Father and Son have spent all eternity with one another. And then he says this, And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And that sets up the invitation to the passage that comes next, which is so important. <clears throat> Because then Jesus says in verse 28, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, I don't think Jesus is just making one claim and then pausing and then making a completely unrelated claim. Th that happens to me, by the way. If you've ever been in a conversation, have you ever had a conversation with somebody and they say one thing, and then they'll say something right afterwards, and that is like, you have not, there's no way to connect those two dots. Have you ever had those conversations? It's just like conversational, you know, 
Tourette's, where they go from one thing to the next and you don't really know what, what's going on. Yeah, that, that happens to me, but it didn't happen to Jesus, and it would be a mistake for us to understand that passage in this way. It is not as if Jesus is saying, nobody knows the Son except the Father, nobody knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And oh, by the way, come to me, all of you, or are weary and heavy laden. Now, what he's trying to help people to understand is it's this invitation to understand who God is, to know God, that this invitation to come to Christ means that when you come to him, you are given revelation that you will not get any other place in in any other way. That until you come to Christ, you will not know who God is. And you will not know who Jesus is. And that is a countercultural message. Because everybody has some pretty good idea that they think that they know who God is. And they're all wrong. And most of the world <clears throat> is pretty sure that they know who Jesus is. And they're not accurate. <clears throat> As a pastor, I've had many conversations with people about the Bible. And what's funny is that in almost every other profession, if you're an expert in something, people sort of defer to your expertise. What I mean by that is when I go to the dentist, <coughs> pardon me, I don't lecture the dentist about how to do dentistry. Do you? Do you sit in the chair and go, you know, you know, when you're doing that filling, here's how you want to do it. Here's what you need to believe about those teeth. Um, when I go to my general practitioner, I don't lecture him about, uh, you know, all the tests that he wants to perform on me. It's like, no, actually, you know, if you knew what you're doing, um, you'd give me this advice. But in pastoral ministry, it seems like every per person I know seems to feel like they have it all figured out about who God is, <laughs> right? And, and I have and multiple conversations I will have with people in which I'm talking to them, and they'll say, well, you know, Jesus said, right? And inevitably, 80% of the time, Jesus never said that. <laughs> Ask me how I know. Because I've read what Jesus said, and I can't find it. There are times, actually, I'll go back, and I'll look it up, and I'm like, I don't think Jesus ever said that. And I can find it. People misquote Shakespeare for Jesus regularly. <laughs> Everybody thinks they know who Jesus is. But Jesus is saying, you don't know who I am. So if you really want to know who I am, then you need to come to me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now the last thing I want to pull from this passage before I move along is this. The concept that Jesus is talking about, this illustration that he's giving, was a very well-known way to train oxen in the ancient world. If you wanted, if you had a new ox, a young ox, and you wanted to train that ox how to plow straight, which is kind of important if you're going to be a farmer, that you don't take two young oxen and put them in a yoke together, because one will be wanting to go off into the lilies, and one will be going, wanting to go off over here to see, you know, this fine young lady ox, you know. Is that what they call women ox? And so it, you, you will not have a straw row of any, a straight row of anything. Your, your field is going to be zigzagged as both of these ox fight against each other for the competing priorities. So what they would do is they would take a seasoned ox who had known the job, and they would yoke that seasoned ox together with a young ox so that when the young ox wanted to go over and check out the fine young other lady ox or wanted to go graze in the lilies, the older ox would be like, nope, we're staying straight. Nope, we're staying straight. Jesus is saying, if you want to know how to understand God the Father and walk in the way that he has prescribed for you, here's what you need to do. You need to yoke yourself to me so that I, who know how to plow straight, can help you learn how to plow straight. Through this relationship that we have together. It is literally an invitation to walk with Jesus. 
It's on-the-job training. It's learning as you go. And he says, the good news is that when you do this, you will experience and understand my gentleness. You will know that I am a gentle and lowly teacher. So my question, the first question that arises from this passage is, have you done that? Have you come to that point in your life in which you've yoked yourself to Jesus? Have you taken his yoke upon you and have you started to learn from him? Because that's the, that's the origin of how you find the fruit of the Spirit. If you want to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit of gentleness in your life, the first place that you need to start is by yoking yourself to the person of Jesus Christ, by coming to him in faith. Apart from that, you will only be trying in the energy of your own personal flesh and strength to be able to exhibit that kind of gentleness, and you'll fail at it. Because it comes from the indwelling Spirit of God, and the only way the indwelling Spirit of God begins to manifest His self in your life is through faith in Christ. More a little bit about that later, but Jesus, when He describes Himself as gentle, is speaking a Greek word, pros, which, praus actually, which shows up again in the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew, Matthew 5, 5, in the Beatitudes, when Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So we often think of those who are strong as the ones who have the ability to accomplish everything that they want to in life. We often think that to the victor goes the spoils, but Jesus has a different version of what things are going to be like in the kingdom to come. And so he said, Blessed are the meek, the gentle, those who do not consider themselves overly impressed by their, by their self-worth or their gentle, and they're gentle and they're humble and they're considerate and they're meek. And James, the third chapter in the 13th verse, tells us and helps us to understand where that meekness comes from. James 3.13, verse 2.18, says this, Who is wise in understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy, does that ever happen to you? Don't raise your hand. Selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For while jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. See, the example of Jesus is not that, that gentleness is something that comes out of weakness, like a person who is gentle because they're weak is weak is gentle because they have to be. They don't have any other option. They don't have the strength to act differently. And there's no honor in that. But a person who has power and strength and nobility and is formidable that person who takes an attitude of meekness, not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance, who is gentle, who is humble, who is considerate, that is the kind of gentleness that Jesus is describing. See, the truth of the matter is, is that if you come to that place in which you've truly trusted Christ, you are a powerful person. The Bible constantly reminds you of the power that resides within. Greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. Do not be afraid, for I have overcome the world, Jesus says. But yet we don't wield that power in a way that is oppressive or dominating to others. Rather, the Bible tells us that we are to exercise it in meekness, in gentleness, not allowing jealousy and selfish ambition to rule our hearts, not allowing ourselves to become boastful, 
but pure and peaceable and gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits. See, the Bible just turns the world on its head. The, the, the world says if you're strong, you inherit the earth because you have the ability to force others to your will. The Bible says, blessed are the meek, for they inherit the earth. And then that leads us to some very practical applications of what it looks like for us to be gentle in the context of church relationships and relationships among our families and also relationships that we have with others. <clears throat> so if you'll turn with me to the sixth chapter of the book of Galatians, we'll look at a couple of examples from that. Galatians chapter 6, starting in the first verse, that word gentleness, praus, comes up again. With the Apostle Paul writing to the Galatians, incidentally, the, the chapter that is right after the fruit of the Spirit, which we read at the beginning of this sermon, Paul begins to give a dispense advice to the Galatians on how they should treat one another, how should they care for one another, recognizing that we are all imperfect, that we all stumble in many ways. J I'm sorry, Paul says in chapter 6, verse 1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own works, and then his reason to boast will be in himself and not in his neighbor. For each one will have to bear his own load. When, when Paul addresses the Galatians, he says, if anybody's caught in a transgression, the first thing you should do, those who are spiritual, those who are filled with the Spirit, should restore that person in a spirit of gentleness. Frankly, if there's anything that the, the, that are the modern day evangelical church can learn, it's that. Because I, I just don't think we've done very good at it. Frankly, I think that the most common way that, that evangelical churches teach how to treat people who have fallen into transgression is to shoot the wounded and just move on without them. <clears throat> and, and it saddens me because I have known many good men and women who have been left behind when they could have been restored in a spirit of gentleness. The reality of the matter is when someone is called into pastoral ministry, everyone has the greatest intention of the world to do everything they possibly can to live as pure and as peaceable and as upright as, as the rest of us. But I can't tell you, I can't, I don't think I can even count on one hand now the number of pastors that I have seen fallen and just rejected. Like left behind. Left by the side of the road to work it out. And it's not just pastors. I've seen people in churches <clears throat> who have fallen and instead of receiving the grace and mercy of their brothers and sisters in Christ, what happens is everyone, the gossip mill just, just goes into overdrive. And everyone's talking about what this person did and how awful this person was and how hypocritical that person must be to have had the audacity to clean themselves up on a Sunday morning and to walk into church as if they were as pure as the rest of us. And to sit in that pew knowing what they know about themselves. And that in itself is a statement of hypocrisy. I mean, if we, were, if we were all real honest, 
We'd all walk into the sanctuary a little gingerly, don't you think? Because none of us have it figured out. And so, in, and so instead of taking another person's sin and constantly shoving it back in their face and telling them, well, I thought that you were a Christian or you should have been doing this or how dare you or look at the disrepute that you brought to the body or let's just pretend that that person never really ever existed and we're going to move on as a people. What if we were to take Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, super seriously and we were to come, a song, come alongside those people and we were to tell them the things that we would want to hear were we in those such situation and circumstances, and you may well be someday. Hmm. Which is this. Yeah, you messed up. Hmm. But God loves you. And Jesus died for you. And the blood he shed from the cross was for the forgiveness of your sins. And while it might take a little bit of time for you to get your, your head around whatever it is that happened in your life, we as a body aren't going to forsake you or leave you behind. We are there for you. I mean, the one thing I like about the church architecture of Baptist Fellowship is that cross, right? <clears throat> If, if, God forbid, there was a fire at Baptist Fellowship, I would be okay with 90% of the building burning straight to the ground, right? Because it's just bricks and sticks. But I hope that God would spare that cross. Hmm. Because that cross is a living and constant reminder of the fact that the blood of Jesus Christ can continues to be effective for you and I, right? Every day, we need to be reminded that we're forgiven. Not just once. Like you, you, you come to the cross, you come to Jesus Christ, you're forgiven, and then for the rest of your Christian experience, I believe that many evangelical churches just sort of preach that you came to the cross, and now the cross is totally irrelevant to your life. It's now up to you. I just, I just don't believe it. And so if we who are walking in the way of Christ would come alongside those who have fallen and restore them in a spirit of gentleness, what a testimony that would be to others, wouldn't it? To an outside world. That if you made the courageous step to join yourself to Christ and started coming to a church that those people wouldn't abandon you if things went wrong. And that's why it says in verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Well, why does that mean fulfill the law of Christ? Well, Jesus' example is to bear our burdens. That's the point behind the cross, isn't it? That he bore our burdens on that tree that we could stand before God having been transgressors and yet forgiven. And then in verse 3, it says, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And that's totally true. Because God is constantly reminding me that I ain't that important. It's not the same thing as not being loved. It's just that I'm not that important. Do you understand the difference? Jesus never needed me to do anything. He doesn't need me to preach. He doesn't need me to counsel. If, if, if God were to take me out of this situation, he would find someone else and raise that person up. Because he can. He doesn't need me. And by the way, God doesn't need you either. He doesn't need you to accomplish anything. But it's not the same thing as him loving you. But he loves you. He loves you more than you can ever understand. The shed blood that he had on the cross, he didn't just have for some faceless, nameless mass of people, when he was on the cross, he saw your face and knew your name. He loves you that much, and he wants you to walk with him and to be with him. And when we embrace that sense of, that humility, which, which holds these two things in tension, which is that God never really needed anybody. 
but that he loves us enough that he was willing to allow his son to bleed and die on a cross in order that we might find our fullness of forgiveness in him. In, in the midst of that, we find the humility that then we can display to the rest of the world to help them to understand who God is. Because remember, nobody knows who the Father is except the Son, and nobody knows who the Son is except the Father. So if you turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, we'll go to the third point of our sermon. Third of three. Which reminds me of one of my favorite jokes. Do you know what it means when a Southern Baptist pastor says, in conclusion? Nothing. Second hmm. Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 22. Paul gives this advice to Timothy. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who, called, who call on the Lord from your heart. Having nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies, you know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. There's that word again. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So the first thing that Paul reminds Timothy of is flee youth for passions. They're not going to get you anywhere. The second thing he says is have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. So the question is, how would you know if something is a foolish controversy? And how would we know if we as a church or we as individuals or we as a family or we as a nation engage in them? And here's how I think we can understand. We know because foolish controversies breed quarrels. Anybody ever noticed any quarreling in our country as of late? Are we, like, totally at peace with each other? It's one of the div most divided times in our nation's history, don't you think? Maybe not quite so severe. <clears throat> but there seems to be a fair amount of bickering going on. And if we find ourselves in the middle of that bickering, then perhaps we need to entertain the possibility that we have gotten caught up in foolish and ignorant controversies. Things that don't really that matter that much in all of eternity. Sometimes I, I think it would be helpful if we as a church were to ask ourselves the question before we engage ourselves on any particular matter, whether it be political or cultural, is in 100,000 years when we're sitting in heaven with Jesus, will any of this have ever mattered? And if the answer is no, then maybe just keep quiet. Maybe it's not worth getting involved in. Second, they, they aren't kingdom matters. We know that foolish and ignorant controversies aren't matters of the kingdom of God. Will it make a difference in the kingdom of God? This that we're talking about right now. Here, here's one. Here's an idea. You'll know it's a, a foolish and ignorant controversy if you can't use your Bible to answer the question without twisting the scriptures. If you have some disagreement with a friend or a neighbor or a coworker about something that is important to you, ask yourself the question, could you open the Bible and prove your point from the Bible? And if the answer is no, then maybe you're involved in a foolish and ignorant controversy. See, one of the things that it's my responsibility to do as a pastor is to emphasize what the Bible emphasizes and pretty much shut up about anything else. Are you with me? It is not my job to weigh in on local political matters. Now, I have opinions, but I keep them to myself. It, I certainly have political opinions about who should or should not be the next president of the United States or how the existing administration is or is not doing. And I have those opinions during this administration and the previous administration and the one before that. And I'll probably have my opinions about the administration to come. But guess what? That's not my job. I keep my mouth pretty well closed on those matters. And if you want to know why, it's because the Bible tells me not to get involved in ignorant controversies, knowing that they breed quarrels. See, I lose my ability, really, as a pastor, to be able to minister to the breadth of people that God might bring to Baptist Fellowship or any other sphere in which I can come into if I become too political, don't I? 
People will write me off, well, he's just a fill in the blank. Or he's just a fill in the other blank on, any, on either side of that political aisle. And once that's happened, I have isolated at least half of the number of people that I might be able to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ to. And I'll tell you what, for me, it's not worth it. I'll give you an example. There was a time in Baptist Fellowship history in the not-too-recent past in which the issue of gun control came up. Well, I grew up in Wyoming, all right? There are three times as many guns as there are people in Wyoming, right? There was no such thing as a gun-free zone because everybody brought their rifle to school with them and then went hunting after school, including the, pres including the principal of the, the high school, Right, this is, what, this is how I grew up. When in my grandmother's house, which I, I, grew, I, I grew up in uh, for a, a significant period of time, um, there was a gun in every house, including, I kid you not, the bathroom. <laughs> Hanging on a little peg <laughs> was a 38, and it was loaded. Now, for the life of me, I don't know what circumstance you're in in which you have to grab a revolver on the pot. <laughs> But just in case, there was one there. I, I remember a time when I snuck out of my grandmother's house. I was like 14 years old. I snuck out of my grandmother's basement. We were, I was going out with my friends. I, I, you know, it was, it was a stupid decision. Kids, don't do this. And I tried to sneak back into the same window. And when I got in, I saw a shiny object and a silver-haired woman behind it. And it was my mother holding a shotgun, pointing it at me. <laughs> And I said, Grandma, it's me, it's me. Please put the gun down. And she said to me, we'll talk first. <laughs> Which is a little disconcerting. So, but it is not my job or my responsibility or my calling to weigh in on that issue. It's an important issue to me personally, but my calling is more than that. My calling is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ with humility and with gentleness. Because it would be a real shame if I, if I platformed that issue at the expense of the souls of the people who I come into my presence, who I've been tasked to share the good news of Jesus Christ with. And there are many issues like that. See, our job, I think if, if we really understood what it meant to exhibit the fruit of gentleness in our life, we would realize that our job is not to win arguments. It's not our job to win the culture war. With all due respect to some of the people who may believe this, it's not our job to win back our country. It's our job to win people for Jesus. And if you want a little substantiation for that biblically, then good for you. It comes from 1 Peter chapter 3. In which Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in the first 13th verse, Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he may bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh to make us alive in the spirit. So what, what, what Peter is advocating is that if you want to know how to, if you want to know how to interface with the world around you as a person who believes in Jesus, he says the first thing you have to do is you have to 
sanctify Christ in your hearts, you have to consider Christ holy. And what that means, he's got to be the one who's in charge. Listen, my family can tell you that when Brian is in charge of Brian's mouth, right, things are not going to go well. But if Jesus is in charge of Brian's mouth, things will be just fine. Can I get an amen from the peanut gallery in the back somewhere? There you go. <laughs> I was hoping Nikki would weigh in, but she knows. And, and the second thing we do is that we are always ready to have an answer, a ready defense for the hope that lies within us. C consider this, right? I, I want you to consider this. Listen, Baptist Fellowship has a long history of trying and diligently helping people to come to a place in which they prepare, are prepared to share their faith, right? And there are whole organizations, some of which are represented in this room today, in which people are trained on how to share their faith, whether it's Campus Crusade for Christ, whether it's Navigators, uh, whether it's uh, Evangelism Explosion. There are all sorts of different ways in which we've tried to train people how to share their faith. But here's what I think. You can tell me I'm wrong, maybe, if you think so. I think people know how to share their faith. I think instinctively people know how to share their faith if they're excited about what it is they're sharing. If you take a gun control advocate and you ask them to share their perspective, most of them would be able to do it very passionately. If you were to take the person on the other side of that aisle and ask them to share their perspectives, most of them would be able to do it very passionately. I know because I have Facebook. <laughs> I know that people are able to share their opinions passionately. Right? You know, it doesn't mean they're doing it perfectly, and it doesn't mean that they're necessarily doing it effectively, but people know how to share their opinions passionately. Sharing Christ has, in my opinion, very little to do with the ability and the skills necessary to do it. It has everything to do, if I could be so bold, with the reality that we all have to deal with sometimes which is that we just are not as excited about Jesus as we are about other things. And listen, if that's you, I'm not, I'm not bringing the hammer of shame down upon you. Because it happens to me too. And the gentleness of Jesus doesn't go away when we come to realize that he's not as important to us as we maybe claim on a Sunday morning when we're all cleaned up and happy. And the end of that verse just gives us so much comfort. For Christ also suffered once for sins all sorts of sins, including the sin of ambivalence. The righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. I'm convinced that that passage that Jesus spoke to us at the beginning of this sermon where he says, all you who are weary and heavy laden to consider this, why don't you come to me? Why don't you handle that feeling in this way? Why don't you come to me? I want you to take my yoke upon you and you learn from me. Because I'm gentle and I'm lowly in spirit and my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And for some of us, we maybe just for the first time, maybe need to bow our heads low enough before Jesus Christ so that he can put that yoke upon us. And if that's you, will you do it today? And maybe for the rest of us, who maybe our passion for other things has overshadowed our passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
maybe this is an opportunity for us to once again bow our heads low enough to allow Jesus to yoke us together with him. Because he loves you. Because he's gentle and he's humble in spirit. And because even though you might have lost a little bit of passion for him, he's never lost his passion for you. And will welcome you again with open arms, saying, my son or my daughter, welcome back. Let's yoke together and get to work. Can we pray together? And can I ask the elders of the church to come forward to help with the Lord's Supper? Before I hand this out, I just want to let you know that if you've not yet come to that place in your life in which you've trusted in Jesus, if, if you're still not ready, well, then would you let this plate pass? Just sit back and, and watch. But if you have or if today you're ready, then by faith will you put your hands into this and take a piece of bread which represents the body of Christ. And would you pray this prayer of confession with me as we prepare our hearts for communion? It's one we can all say. It's just a prayer that reminds us of our need for Jesus, of our faith in him, of our belief in his resurrection, and acknowledge that we need him and are willing to obey him. And it goes like this. And we can all pray it in our hearts if we like. Lord Jesus, we know we need you and we still need you. We thank you for that self-sacrifice, bleeding and dying on a cross and allowing your body to be broken that we may become whole and forgiven. And in this moment, we confess with our mouth, Lord Jesus, that you are Lord. And we believe in our heart of hearts that you have been raised by our Father from the dead. And Lord God, we anticipate your coming again to rule and reign on this earth until then, May you help us be faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he broke it, he said, This is my body, which is given for you. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me.
Thank you, Red Sun. <laughs> you too. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. And Lord God, as we remember the body of Jesus, let us be reminded of his sacrifice, his willingness to place himself in gentleness rather than calling down the armies of angels of the heavenly host to defend him he willingly took the Roman cross upon himself in humility and meekness to your will Lord God that we might be made whole and for this we remember him and we pray these things in Jesus name amen After dinner, Jesus took the cup, and when he blessed it, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me.
Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the reminder that we have in this cup of your forgiveness of us. Lord, though our lives astray, though our minds can fixate themselves on things other than the kingdom, though our priorities can drift, this cup reminds us that the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from every sin that he has removed our guilt and shame. As the book of Isaiah says, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, yet you shall be like wool. That he has cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. May this be a reminder to, to those who have come to, trice, come to trust in Christ Jesus that they are forgiven that they are set free, that they stand in his victory because we have trusted in a meek and humble Savior who has the power to save. And we pray these things in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, and all God's people said. Amen. And now let's stand together and sing that old hymn, Amazing Grace. Father in heaven, will you take these people whom you have purchased by the blood of your Son, to whom you have redeemed by that perfect sacrifice of Jesus' body on the cross, and will you fill them with your power and your joy as they go out into the world this day? May they be reminded of your promise that you will never leave them, nor will you ever forsake them, that you are with them always to the very end of the age. And if Christ is for us, then who can be against us? And we remind these things in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. There's a box in the back if you want to give to the ongoing work of Baptist Fellowship, and we'll see you next week. We love you.